Okay, so today's plan is the following. Um, I will sort of briefly talk about uh, what we mean by alternative. I, I don't think it was sort of uh, perfectly clear in my lecture notes, uh, which is kind of because in economics we're not perfectly clear about, you know, some things. And alternative is one of them. I mean, we don't really formally define them, although we define them formally uh, before every model that we sort of describe. Uh, but in general, definition is, is not really there. So that might be confusing for some. So uh, once I talk about it for a few minutes, I will basically um, uh, go deeper into the idea of lexicographic preferences. Uh, the reason why I go through lexicographic preferences, well, one, it's uh, highly intuitive, actually, uh, um, a way of compare uh, things. And, and, but, but, but the thing is, it's, it's sort of a, 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 a preference relation which cannot be represented by a utility function. Uh, if you watch the videos, you probably know what I mean. Um, but nevertheless, it's important because, as I said, it's, it's simple, relatively um, intuitive. And so it is a good exercise to understand a, a bit of the details of preference relation and, and so on. So while we talk about it, I will basically talk about and introduce what I mean by continuous preferences. Again, I did not formally define it in my lecture videos. So today I'm going to define what we mean by continuity in preferences and basically argue, uh, I mean, uh, it's, I'm not going to give a formal proof, but I am going to argue and so informally prove that the lexicographic preferences are actually not continuous. All right, so let's start with what we mean by alternative. So if you, again, watch the videos, you will probably uh, keep hearing that the agent, the decision maker, is selecting an alternative. But what do we really mean by alternative? In fact, the very important question is, when we say something is an alternative, for example, does it include all the aspects of, uh, of, 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 of the alternative? Uh, so one example I was giving in the uh, lecture videos was the internet, right? So there's like three alternatives, A, B, C. One alternative was uh, Fido internet, 150 megabyte download speed with a price $75. And another one is the Rogers, you know, uh, 50 megabyte, uh, one gigabyte, uh, with the prices as well. So, for example, here, when I say an alternative, do I mean the internet, meaning the speed, the download, upload speed, and, you know, a bunch of other properties it, it may have, plus the price? Or do I exclude the price when I talk about uh, this is one alternative, that is another alternative? Uh, so, in general, it depends, all right? So, it, uh, meaning uh, you can define uh, alternative as you wish. So, an alternative can be pure good itself, like, for example, Apple, all right? So, Apple is an alternative. But the thing is, Apple in grocery store one is a different alternative than an Apple in grocery store two, simply because uh, their prices are different. Um, second, their locations are different to my house. Let's say the grocery store one is a walking distance, but the grocery store two is not a walking distance and I have to drive there. So therefore, directly or indirectly, its cost is higher for me. All right. So are, for example, these, you know, uh, other concerns like, you know, price, the cost of reaching to that good, etc. Are they also a part of the description when I say alternative one, alternative two? Again, that totally depends on how you define an alternative in a context. Uh, in a consumer theory, for example, uh, we are going to keep talking about bundles, right? Uh, I mean, I can fairly talk about them because you already know what we mean by bundles uh, from intermediate microeconomics. Uh, so a bundle is basically a basket of goods, all right? So uh, let's look at a simple scenario where there are good, two goods. So good one and good two. Um, and most of the times we say like good one is basically the, um, I don't know, uh, the good you want to buy, let's say apples, right? So uh, let's denote it by X. And then good two is basically everything else. All right, so the X is the units of apples. Um, and for simplicity, we assume that you can buy any, 
I'm sorry, you can choose any real number, uh, although uh, nobody is selling, for example, half an apple or a quarter of an apple. So the unit of uh, unit of apple that is sold normally is like one apple, two apple. In fact, it's like maybe kilo or pound, whatever. But for simplicity and for convenience, we assume that you can actually uh, choose for simplicity, again, uh, any real number as a quantity of apple. And good too, it basically represents everything else. Yes, but for example, in this uh, description of an alternative, right? So this bundle is, I mean, for example, one apple and one good wine. This is one alternative. Another is 1.52. This is another alternative, right? 0.5 comma three. This is another. So here I'm basically just giving you three uh, examples for an alternative. So the question is sort of a more broader question is which alternative uh, is the consumer going to pick? Well, again, in this description of my alternative, uh, are we talking or incorporating the price? Meaning, is this one apple with a price P and this is another uh, apple with another price? Or are they this, you know, just the units and the price is fixed, right? I mean, are the prices incorporated into the description? Well, once again, in consumer theory, we exclude prices. All right, um, and so therefore, when you compare two alternatives, you purely look at how much uh, unit of good one and good two, or apples on the other goods you need, without looking at the prices, okay? Normally, obviously, when we make a comparison between alternatives, we not only look at how much I need that good, but I also, you know, how costly it is gonna be uh, for me. Right, for example, uh, sort of a simpler example, if I'm gonna buy a car, right? So there are a bunch of different cars and models, right? That a Honda has models, Toyota has models, you know, BMW has models. So there are a lot of alternatives. They're not uh, sort of uh, continuous, I mean, perfectly divisible, but well, they're alternatives. But the thing is, when I choose what car to buy, uh, the price, of those cars and my budget obviously affects my preferences. So uh, are they incorporated into my preference relation or you see what I mean in, in, in the description of alternative? The answer is in a normal demand theory, consumer theory, the answer is no, right? Prices, income, these are excluded from your uh, description of alternative, which means when we talk about preferences, your, those preferences are purely described over set of alternatives where alternatives uh, basically indicate nothing but quantity of goods. Okay, that's very, very important. Later, obviously, we are going to incorporate price and income, right? You, you choose a, a, an alternative to maximize your utility. We're not there yet. It's, it's coming up in next weeks. Uh, subject to your budget constraint, your income and price, etc. So income price are going to affect your choice set, all right? And so uh, the price obviously is going to affect your, in that sense, preferences, okay? But the thing is, when we talk about preferences, again, in consumer theory, uh, well, producer theory, kind of related, uh, we basically mean purely uh, the, uh, 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 the consumption goods, the quantities of these consumption goods, prices and income, all of them are sort of excluded. All right, so that's what we mean by alternative. Any question?